Welcome to a community built of tomorrow's business leaders. Hey guys, I'm William Freitas and this is the Socius Podcast. Socius, welcome back to another episode. Today we have Sammy Yeager from the Independent Executives. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Sammy, uh, we want to hear about, I guess, firstly your business, um, but specifically, you know, the topic around you know, the difference between a visionary and an implementer, you know, and I know that's exactly what you specialize in. So tell us a little bit about those two elements, where it comes from and, and how businesses can incorporate it within their business. Yeah. So independent executives is coming up on two years old officially. We, um, we started working on it about six months before we incorporated. Um, so I have two business partners, Daniel and Murray and myself, um, and we work with businesses that are running on the entrepreneurial operating system and they have a gap in their leadership team where the visionary, so generally the founder or the owner of the business, um, the person who's got a million ideas before breakfast, uh, is missing their integrator, the person who can take that big idea and turn it into the first 100 steps that need to happen to actually bring that vision to reality. And so effectively you're helping those visionaries as implementers, is that right? Oh, so I'm going to correct you really early. So an implementer (laughs) is someone who's trained in the entrepreneurial operating system. They're like a business coach and they teach businesses those tools. The integrator is the person inside the business that operates as the buffer between the visionary and the leadership team. My apologies. You got it. Got it. I know awesome. it's tricky because they're higher names. Correct. They're easy to mix and that's, up. That's what had me going. Okay, cool. So to re-clarify, you're an EOS implementer in a way, is that right? No, but no. both of my business partners are. Perfect. Okay. And the business itself is to act as the integrator. Yeah. So we have a talent pool of senior level experienced leaders who also have experience in the entrepreneurial operating system or EOS. Mm -hmm. Um, And we have a talent pool of these special humans Mm -hmm. um, and we drop them into businesses on a part-time or fractional basis. So each of our integrators work with somewhere between like one and five clients at any one moment in time. And they act as like a, a extra person to that team who are focused on the inside. So that integrator is really focused on having really great, healthy leadership team meetings every week, making sure that everybody is held accountable, that we have the data that we need, that our people issues are being addressed. So they're very much focused on the the well-being and the performance of the leadership team. Because it's a key element, right? Because, uh, you know, I'm not sure what the statistics are and I'm sure maybe you can elaborate, but I feel like everyone that creates a business or a large portion of people that create a business, they can probably start off as a technician um, and then they have this vision to create something, right? Or they have a thousand visions and then they really struggle to, I guess I want to use the word integrate that into the business mm-hmm. or, or keep themselves as well as their teams accountable in delivering a project. And it's really hard to find the right integrator, the one who want, is happy to sit in behind and, and make things Make sure things get delivered, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's second in charge. So the idea is roughly that there's like, it's a guesstimate, but for every one visionary that there's like a quarter of that of integrators. Mm. So for visionaries, there might be one integrator. So it is challenging and that's part of the appeal of our business model is that we've got these incredible integrated talent who can service more than one visionary. And so tell us a little bit more about the entrepreneurial operating system, right? Because um, some people that have listened to the show may have heard little elements of it or they may have read the book Traction. Is that right? Tell us more about, I guess, how specifically it, it works for businesses. Yeah, so the entrepreneurial operating system is wrapped up in that book Traction by Gino Wickman and it's basically six core components to running your business um, and it, they really are simple tools. So if you think of like your operating system as the your structure, it's your way of being, it's a, your way of doing, um, it's... It, you, you roll it in from the, the ground up almost um, and it's a way of structuring each part of your business to bring alignment, bring that level of same pageness and we basically end up with a two-page business plan or a vision traction organiser, so something that outlines the vision, where is it that the business is going, how are we going to get that traction, how are we going to 
hit the rubber and the road at the same yeah. time and get that traction and get it sticky. Yeah. And how have we got that organized? What are the what are the big ten year picture that we're shooting for? What's our three year picture? What's our one year t- one year goals? Mm. And then what are we doing in the next ninety days to bring us closer to that one year set of goals and so on? And at what size do you think it is relevant for a business to adopt the EOS model or or, or system? Because um, you know. I guess uh, I've read traction and and there are elements that there are various different roles, right? Firstly, you might have the visionary and then the integrator, but then you've got to have a a leadership team, right? So is there a stage where you would think you adopt it a little bit more or, or can you adopt it as a smaller business? So I would say that businesses will get the most out of it in terms of working with an EOS implementer if they've got a a team of 10 or more Mm -hmm. um, and are sort of doing anywhere from like 2 million to maybe 15 million um but you can absolutely take some of these tools if you're at a earlier stage or at a later stage um but that's where the i guess the most success has been seen documented that's there's probably around 700 eos implementers around the globe and they've all worked with you some of them have worked with 20 clients some of them have worked with thousands of clients Mm. um and that's where we see like the most documented sort of success in that sweet spot and in the instance that it was a small business, it's just that more that more than I guess one person would be wearing more than one hat, right? Yeah. And that would be the challenge. Yeah. So in the um, EOS system, we talk about like the five main functions. So we have our visionary, our integrator, our sales and marketing, our operations or delivery, and then the finance and admin. So every business has some combination of those five and you might call them slightly different things and you might have sales and marketing separately or you might have, you know, different arms of your operations and delivery. But for the most part, there's those five kind of umbrellas and each of those are really, really important and that integrator brings harmony or integrates them to to harmoniously work towards that vision that's led from the top, from that visionary. And I guess this is a really perfect timing, I guess, to, to have this discussion because I think a lot of people might be going through, I guess, reviewing their goals potentially and, and looking to make sure that they're heading in the right direction for the year. Um, now, what are some of the elements that you would suggest or, or, or what are some of the tips that you would provide to businesses when they're looking at setting goals, right? Um, I find a lot of people sort of set 12 month goals and that's it, mm. right? Um, obviously there are 90 day rocks, is that right? Is that how yeah. it works? Yeah, so the EOS process will take you through um, unpacking like the big big vision, like the BHAG, the moonshot, yeah. the where are we going? And generally visionaries have, have got that so clear in their mind, but they often have difficulty explaining it or sharing it. It's like, um, you know, if I was to hum twinkle twinkle little star but you had no idea what I was humming like it would sound perfectly clear to me in my head but doesn't necessarily land when it's being shared and I find that's quite common with visionaries that they they know exactly what it is that they're picturing but they struggle to take people on that journey mm-hmm. so you, you got to zoom all the way out like what is the BHAG where are we going and sometimes you know out we've got uh, people in our workforce you know more than half of our workforce now are millennial or younger um, and when you say like oh where do you want to be in 20 years like they, we just can't contextualize that you know five years ago we had no idea what would have happened in the last five years so we kind of go what is the 10-year picture and those can be monetary goals it could be profitability it could be revenue size it could be you know where is your office located but it could also be like we're a b corp recognized organization we've won a great place to work initiative we've got a president's club you know we've got uh, our team vibe is tracking at this we've got a retention of that you know we've partnered with these events or we've spoken on these stages or we've secured partnerships with whatever it might be so they're not the 10-year picture is not always like monetary it's not just about financial growth it can be like what does it really look like and often um, employees don't always resonate with like oh we're going to go from 1 million to 5 million in the next 10 years. Like that doesn't really mean anything to a lot of your workforce. Um, So being able to paint the picture of like, what is the vision? And that's where I would encourage any visionary to start for, um, you know, really getting into the goals. It's like, okay, let's go for the big picture. What does that sound like, look like? Paint it for me or paint it, create, really you want to co-create this with your leadership team. Um, And then we distill it back. Okay, if we want to be there in 10 years, 
where do we want to be in three years and what are some more tangible things that we might need to do on our way to that 10-year picture? And then from that three year, what are we going to do in the next one year? Mm -hmm. And then from that, what are we going to do in this next 90 days? So quarter at a time, how do we get there? quarter at a time so the the back to your original question though like how do you go about setting rocks or what are some of the common things that you see setting goals is that we want to do way too many things we tend to overestimate what we can do um, in a short period of time but underestimate what we can do in a long period of time so we kind of encourage that businesses don't really set any more than like five to seven goals for for the year but that even that's like a lot yeah and i guess it depends on how I mean, there's ways to word goals, right? That is yeah. so lofty that includes so much. Yeah. <laughs> and I think I'm probably um, guilty of saying, let's do this, let's do that, let's do a little bit of everything. That's probably why you're the visionary of your business, right? Uh, potentially. You know, there was, <laughs> there was a saying the other day that um, I heard and I'm, I'm going to probably mess it up here, but it's like the people that were seen dancing were thought to be crazy by those who couldn't hear the music. Mm. And I love that because... Our role is to identify, like you said, what the picture looks like. And it might be as ridiculous and as audacious as, as, you know, as it can be for your industry or whatever it might be. But um, it's super important for your team to break it down, right? Um, now, how often would you suggest reviewing those goals? You know, is it, is it always on a quarterly basis? Yeah, so in the EOS like methodology or best practice, is we actually talk about those every single week at, mm. at what is called the level 10 meeting or an L10 meeting. So that happens same place, same day, same time, same agenda every week. So you're gathering of the minds and we check in on those, those rocks that we set for the quarter every single week. Are they on track or are they off track? And if they're on track, uh, if they're off track, what are we doing about it in the next seven days to get mm. it back on track? So it's not something that we sit down at a strategy session like once a year and go, yeah, yeah, this is what we're going to do and then never, you know, put it in a filing cabinet or put mm. it in the cloud somewhere and never mm. look at it again. And that's really one of the key uh foundational parts of having a really strong integrator is that holding that cadence of those weekly meetings get making sure that those um that 90 minutes together every week is really good investment of time and mm. that we are making progress on the things that we all agreed were the most important thing in this business mm. and the idea is to restrict the amount of time that you're wasting in meetings right yeah. and make them super focused so that you get the most out of it um now I guess from, from that perspective, in, in terms of taking it to the next level, um, what would you suggest for businesses to, to do when they're thinking about setting their goals? And, and obviously what I love about it is when you're reviewing it weekly, mm. um, it makes it so clear. But are there elements that, they, that businesses can do? I mean, are they putting it up on their, you know, boards is it, is it vision based? Is yeah. it in their mission statement? How, how, do, how would you structure it? So... The VTO, the Vision Traction Organizer, as part of EOS is available to anyone free. You can go and Google and download and get a copy of this. But it basically it ends up as a two-page business on a plan, uh, business two-page business plan, super easy to look at. But I think if you're going to go about populating that and filling in the information like what's our core focus, what's our niche, what's our core values, how, what's our marketing strategy, what are the big goals, is you need to get the most important people in your business, um, whether or not you've got a defined leadership team or you've got brewing leaders who look like they might be head of department type leaders um, you want to gather them up together and sometimes it's not it's not always like more is better sometimes it's just you need the key meeting of the minds mm. you need to get those people together you need to get them away from the day-to-day -day environment whether or not that's your office or whatever it might be it needs to be a, a fresh new different space away from the daily noise of the business and you need a whole day um, so in the EOS process, that's called the focus day and that's the beginning of an EOS journey and you unpack all of those things um, like to get really clear on what, what are the values that we represent, what are the things that we want more of in this business and who are the key players that we already have on our team who are you know, living, breathing um, models of that. So you want to get those people away and then you want to talk about unpacking, like what is the vision for the business and then what are maybe some of the, the goals that we can put in place for us to all work towards. 
And you would suggest doing that annually? How, how often would you do those focus Yeah, meetings? so in uh, EOS pres- prescribes a two-day annual planning, so yeah. two days every year. So you get together with your leadership team, review that annual plan, unpack what the what went well in the mm. previous year. Did we hit our measurables? Did we not? If not, why not? What went wrong? What went right? Do we have the right people in the right seats? A um, whole big you know, agenda that we can, again, you can have a a Google and share what is the EOS annual planning agenda for day one and day two. But as a, if if you're, if you really want to lean into this, reach out to an EOS implementer and have a free 90 minute meeting. They offer, they all offer this um, globally around the world for free. Just reach out to someone and they'll take you through it. But this is, um, you can, you can Google it if you want to do some self-implementation. Um, but to work through that together and just really get the ideas flying around, you know, who, who do we want to be, who do we serve and how are we going to do that? Perfect. And I guess how many, this might be a cheeky question here, but how many, is it possible for clients to come and approach you and utilise your services without implementing the EOS model or is that something you strongly mm. recommend? So uh, there are lots of fractional integrator individuals and fractional integrator agencies around, not just Australia, but globally. So yes, but not with us. <laughs> Got it. Got it. And, and that's likely because you know that it works. Yeah, right? we do and, know that it works. so much investment of your time and, you, you know, you want to guarantee results. The US implementer might have sat in a session room with hundreds of leadership teams have got a a huge vast toolbox of experience with Mm. the eos tools and their cross-pollinated kind of industry experience so they'll always be able to give a different point of view than you know their integrator who's really focused on the the health and well-being of a leadership team it's a very different set of um, skill sets kind of like one's the teacher and then one's the doer or the implementer you know Perfect. And, and what would you say, because I'm sure there are plenty of listeners out there who are going, you know what, we've probably only got seven or eight staff members mm-hmm. and we're not quite sure whether one of that staff the staff members is ready to take on that operations role or yeah. that finance role. How would you suggest that they transition that individual into that role? Because obviously from what I can hear about the model is it liberates the visionary to, to do what they do best. Yeah. To dream big, visualize things, put it down onto paper and then lead. Yeah, so one of the greatest um, EOS tools, it's one of the foundational tools is our accountability chart. And that's kind of where I referenced earlier that there's those five main functions. Um, and within those five functions, each of those functions have a handful of really core key accountability so we're not talking like the title of business development manager or sales manager or head of sales or anything like that but what are they truly accountable for it's like well either generating leads or nurturing leads closing deals managing pipeline like what are they actually accountable for so that's where I would start is to if you're if your team is growing if you're under that sort of a dozen or so headcount like get it out on paper it's not that those um, people only sit in one seat it's much like a one-man band right like all, there's still a harmonica there's still a drums there's still I don't know whatever else a one-man band has got yeah, but yeah. though the it's triangle. not yeah the tri- triangle <laughs> can't forget the triangle um, it's not that those uh, seats don't exist it just happens that they're in the beginning they're occupied yeah. by one person yeah. so what are the seats that exist in your business do that as a thought experience exercise what are the true seats and accountabilities that exist within the sales team or within the sales and marketing department or within operations and delivery you know the yeah. thing that you you do the thing that you sell the service you provide mm-hmm. whatever that is what are the seats that are in there I would start there and get clear about what are the needs of that business and then to honestly think about the humans that you already have uh, do they get it do they get that seat do they want that seat and is it maybe just about the capacity like and that capacity could be about upskilling or it could be there you know that they just need a bit more eq and it need a bit more leadership training or whatever the thing might be mm-hmm. but you need to have clarity over the need of the business not the person perfect and and from what i can hear in it even in the i guess the name of the title of the, of the tool the accountability mm. you said the accountability matrix is that what uh, accountability chart accountability chart the fact that it increases accountability is what i like about mm. it you know because i feel like every small to medium business owner 
to some extent lacks accountability, you know, because they're the ones keeping themselves accountable. And Which is very hard to do. <laughs> very hard to do because your brain is, is so, so good at like coming up with excuses for you not to do something or for you to focus your energy on something else. And or if you're a visionary, just get distracted by the newest, sexiest, shiniest idea that you came up with this morning. Correct. The syndrome of the new shiny idea. Yeah. Um, so I, I love the idea that it, you know, increases accountability across the board, across each individual person and everyone owns one little element. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm a big, I've been a big advocate for ownership culture and, you know, this is what it sounds like to me that the EUS really adopts, you know, is... Um, accountability for each particular task, ownership for each particular task. And no doubt when when that works like a well-oiled machine, results just, you know, stem from that, I presume. Yeah, Rocket Fuel. <laughs> okay, tell me about Rocket Fuel. Yeah, so Rocket Fuel is the book that sits alongside Traction. It was written by Gino Wickman and Mark C. Winters and it explores that exact... I have not thing. read this book. It's great. Um, like it sounds like hyperbole but it literally changed my life because I was like, ah, oh, integrator, that's what I am that's the skill set that I have and I never had a word for it before I you know it was like project manager general manager like what is it that I've got this unique ability for um but it, that's what happens is when you have a really great visionary and you have a really great integrator and they have a really strong relationship it creates rocket fuel and that well-oiled machine like you mentioned mm. hits the moon interesting you know as you say this you know I saw I mean, it may not be in every particular instance, but the I wonder the amount of successful small business business businesses that start with a husband and wife combo, a visionary and integrator combo, and whether that would work. Visionary integrator pretty type couple is Tom and Lisa Billiou. Uh, they started the Quest Nutrition Bars, oh. um, and. Tom out front is absolutely the visionary and his wife is absolutely the integrator Um, and they've got a really beautiful working relationship but they talk about this idea about, yeah, having very clear accountabilities within the the business. They've sold it now. Um, Mm. But, yeah, that that was they had to have those conversations when they were emotionally sober, like what's your responsibility, what's my responsibility and if we lock heads, you know, if it's in your wheelhouse, you're going to get precedent and I'm going to know back you even if i disagree yeah i mean i think it's a a really good clear delineation for any partnership really Mm -hmm. any business partnership everyone sort of says that the the key to that is having clear delineated roles and that's that it's about what happens when you have a really great visionary and the visionary really understands their role Mm -hmm. they're looking out and up ahead and they can focus on that you know they're great at like closing the big deals and those kinds of things um and getting to play and tinker with new product to market fit those kind of things Mm -hmm. um and then the integrator when they're left to their abilities um to really get the boat rowing mm. with a really good cadence all at the same time. So that integrator, the, the visionary has a tendency to like create like organizational whiplash where it's like, yeah. we're going this way. Oh wait, now we're going this way. Oh wait, now we're going back that way again. So the integrator kind of is the opportunity to filter that and stop the leadership team feeling all of the left, right, left, right, left, right. Um, the inconsistency, right? Yeah. So when that, that um, visionary integrator relationship is strong, um, and the visionaries let go of the reins. They've been out of, or in EOS language, let go of the vine. Um, that creates rocket fuel. Yeah, perfect. And why do you think it's so difficult to find integrated? What is it? Do you, do you think there's something psychologically or, or from a cultural standpoint, you know, or societal standards? I mean, to me, my, my personal opinion is that it sounds like everyone wants to be the entrepreneur yeah. and the integrator doesn't quite necessarily always not a sexy get. right <laughs> it's not as sexy to be too icy or in yeah. in the wings or but it's just as stage. important and just as impressive for those who understand yeah i think there's kind of that thing like where there are business owners who are not entrepreneurs and there are entrepreneurs who are not business owners so one part i think in terms of why it's challenging to find an integrator there could be a whole host of reasons but one of the ones that i see is like a hesitancy from a visionary or an owner to like actually believe that it's possible believe that there is someone that they're compatible with 
who could take away the things that they hate doing and do a lot of the galvanizing and the rallying of people and the organizing and the holding of cadence like where are you up to with this have you done that is this due if you don't get this then that's going to fall over here like that's not necessarily the strengths of a visionary but often because they've built their baby from the ground up mm. they they did do that role they did sit in that seat even if they didn't acknowledge it mm. and it's it's they're two very different skill sets so it's really hard to do it's not impossible um and it does exist in some magical unicorn um humans i've seen a couple of them who are really good at both um seats but i think this the starting point is even just acknowledging like, do you know what? Yeah, I am a visionary and I'm going to have a whole lot more fun and I'm going to be better at being a leader mm. if I just stay in that sandpit and I recognize that I need even need an integrator. You know, and I find it interesting that you mention um, that the visionaries don't necessarily believe that it's possible that somebody else could mm. could do that task. You know, one of my biggest pet peeves is when people say, um, your people care half as much as the business owner does. Mm. I bring it back to if they buy into the vision and they understand mm. what they're doing, you know, every step, every day that they take is is towards a common goal, not just a company goal of, as you mentioned, one to five million, mm. how the hell are we gonna get there? If we break it down to a quarterly basis, a weekly meeting, level 10 meeting, you mm. said, how are we getting there? How are we keeping each other accountable? Is this something we actually want? Mm. And I feel like it also weeds out the individuals who don't actually wanna be there, right? Yeah. Um, going back to what I mentioned earlier, that the visionary is responsible for the culture. Like, I, I don't know, what's that terrible book, like The Fish Rots from the Head? Yes. Like, yeah. Yeah. I, and um, if that is the culture that you have created in your business, you got to take some ownership of that. Mm. Like, uh, environment dictates performance. What environment did you create? for your team to perform and I, I'm quite lucky that I had the opportunity to lead a remote first team back in 2018 so pre-pandemic before working remotely was not necessarily the norm mm. but we were absolutely a remote first team across nine different time zones and our team was highly accountable we were highly accountable high performance team and anyone who wanted to clock in and clock out and kind of fly under the radar really just didn't fit the culture but it was really quite um, not uh, not binary, but like it's it's hard. It's, it's easy. It's just clear it? cut that yeah, you you white. don't you don't belong in this culture. Like go mm. find somewhere where you are going to be happy, and if you want to coast under the radar and not really do a whole lot, go find somewhere that will allow that and it will tolerate that. So coming back to what you said about like owners saying, um, you know, your employees are only going to care fifty percent. Like, have you given them something to care about? Have you given them a compelling vision? Have you helped them to understand the part that they play in achieving that role uh, or achieving that, that big vision or that big goal? Because, I mean, ultimately we all come to work for some sort of personal gain, don't we? And everyone's got a different thing. It could be about growth. It could be about career progression. It could be about creating financial stability. It mm. could be about creating opportunities that I actually then got to go and volunteer on the, my passion project outside of work. Exactly. You know, work plays a role um, in everybody's personal needs, fulfilling some kind of personal needs. But um, the data is saying more and more that millennials and the generations under want to come to work to contribute to something greater than themselves. So as a leader, as a founder, as a visionary, like, and you're not getting what you want out of your workforce, I would encourage you to go inwards and ask why and what have you been doing to uh, get the most out of your team i agree challenge that absolutely challenge it because um you know i find it interesting that you mentioned that i guess today's staff member or today's team member wants to i guess satisfy their personal needs if i, if I mm. can summarize it in that sense and i i would assert too that it's more than just money. It's more than just building some totally. financial wealth. For, for, for some, that can be a larger portion of their need, right? But there definitely needs to be some vision and some values that they can attach themselves to, you know, anchor themselves to and, and drive forward mm. because then, then it is just trading time for money. And, and I think as a society, we've grown past that. 
you know, we've, we've definitely gone past the trading time for money and, and we definitely want something to work towards. Now, I want to know a little bit more about Sammy. Like how does yeah. Sammy get into this? How does Sammy, well, obviously you read Traction. You went, oh, wow, cool. I'm an integrator. That's, yeah. that's what I'm labeling myself as. But where were you before that? How did you stumble across Traction? How did you get into what you're doing? Yeah, so I started my career, um, I studied project management, specializing in events. And then I uh, realized pretty quickly that I hit a ceiling in my like capacity. I was in the projects that I was going to get to work on, uh, the money that I was going to be able to earn, the impact I was going to be able to have. And I worked with a career coach to sort of unpack like some of my skill set and what, what might be transferable. Um, and at the time I was working with a training company who provided training to, to business owners and um, small business owners. Uh, and I just loved business. Like I always have like even early days, like one of my first jobs, I was self-employed um, and I would go to like this, uh, the hackathons and start up weekends and all of these kind of things. And I'd always sort of gravitated to putting myself in the environment of hanging out with business owners, hanging out with coaches, hanging out with people who were growth oriented, growth minded. But yeah, so I started working with um, this company who was delivering training and education to business owners in an events and projects role. And I moved into a program management role and a membership um, sort of community role. And at that time, that business was rolling out AOS into their business and they um, hired their first integrator and she was phenomenal um, and I'm very grateful that I got to learn from her and she's still one of my very good friends but she moved on um, within sort of two years and I was very grateful that I got to step into her her role so in that time I'd kind of seen uh, the transformation that this business went through from pre-EOS to post-EOS um, and what that integrator role when done well how much impact it can have. And you wanted that impact, right? You wanted to yeah. provide that value. Yeah, and I just recognised that um, the ability to be the centre spoke in a wheel is, it, it is, it's a unique ability. It's not something that everybody can do to bring vendors, partners, stakeholders, team, partners, all of the people together to be on the same page at the same time with the same intentions. It's not an easy thing to do. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of how my integrator sort of career started and, yeah, I because I'd seen um, EOS be rolled out into this business and I was part of our first leadership team and then I um, graduated into being part of our global leadership team as well. Um, so I got a lot of um, visibility and because I was working in an organisation where our client base were business owners and businesses and I saw a lot of them adopting EOS and the impact it was having in their businesses and with their leadership teams, um, I was like, I was just hooked. I was just like, wow, this I've seen so many people People struggle to sort of organize the, mm. the, themselves and the way that they do business. And now I really can't imagine working for a business that, or in a business that wasn't running on EOS because yeah. it just provides such a, a streamlined um, approach to everything and just creates clarity. You know, sometimes I talk to girlfriends and friends who are like, haven't had a performance conversation in two years. They don't actually know what the business's main objectives are at the moment. Wow. They don't understand how what they do contributes to that. They don't know if they or the business is succeeding. And I was saying, it doesn't have to be like that at all. No, it really doesn't. Yeah. And you can, you can understand why job satisfaction is low in those yeah. environments. And so obviously you've then carried that on and started independent executives, yeah. which is a, a fractional integrator model. Is that, yeah. is that correct? So I met basically because I became obsessed with EOS, um, I had a really strong relationship with uh, the two people who brought it out to Australia. Mm -hmm. And I uh, just kind of hung around that community or that the community of EOS implementers here in, in APAC is about 30 or so. Um, and they've all come from their own entrepreneur journeys and they are, it's an incredible community of people who are very abundance-minded. Like I said, you know, any one of them will meet with you for 90 minutes, give you all of the tools for free. Like you just put your hand up and say you want that and um, they will do that. So it's, they're a really beautiful bunch of people. But, yeah, so through that I met my business partner, Daniel Williams, 
And I, at the time I had been providing like some fractional integrator services on a project sort of basis um, and helping teams roll out things where they identified like, hey, this isn't working so well, let's bring Sammy in and she can help us with that. So at that time I met my business partner um, and I started helping him in his EOS practice. And then we, we realized that there's this huge gap in the market for integrators and that when a business is implementing EOS, but there's still a visionary who's straddling their seat and the integrator seat, it struggles. Or if the integrator seat is being occupied by somebody who is maybe integrator and head of sales or and head of marketing or and head of operations, um, it can be really hard split focus. Mm -hmm. Or maybe if somebody is brand new to that integrator seat too, like brand new to the integrator seat, brand new to EOS, brand new to leadership, brand new to the industry, their industry, it can be really hard. So we just kind of noticed this gap and it was amongst almost all of the clients that um, Dan was working with was amongst almost all a lot of the clients that other EOS um, implementers were working with in our our region. And we went, there's got to be a better way. If it's four to one, mm. um, maybe we can flip that a little bit and make each integrator available to more than one visionary. And it's also an incredible opportunity for fractional integrators or people who are of that um, caliber of leader. And they have that business experience. They have that senior leadership team level um, of experience. They're familiar with EOS, but maybe they don't want to work full time, or maybe they have a little visionary mm. entrepreneurial flair as well, and they've got their own other side thing going on. It's a great way to be able to um, have that the market who needs an integrator and the integrator who maybe doesn't want to be full time to sort of match together. It adds a great sense of flexibility, right? And, Huge. And for anyone listening who doesn't fully understand what fractional business models are, I think you are, you explained it really well. Um, but it seems to be all the hype, you know, fractional CFOs, mm -hmm. fractional marketing, fractional integrators. It's If I can dumb it down, it's like an integrator on hire, yeah. effectively, like a marketing person on hire or a CFO on hire. Your specific instance, it's an integrator on hire. So you know, you, you might need that person one day a week, or whatever it might be, or, you know, maybe it's the level, to run the level 10 meeting. I, I'm not sure. Yeah. It's, it's that model, you, right? You got it. Yeah. So we, we offer three different sort of tiered and it's like that, what I, the gap that I mentioned before. So you, maybe you don't have an integrator. That's like our highest touch mm. um, package. And like you said, we'll run your level 10 meeting for you. We will attend your quarterly planning session and, and capture everything that needs to be captured. Um, we'll run a same page meeting with that visionary once a month. Um, we'll provide some coaching to either the person who's going to step into that integrator role or the visionary or the leadership team who wherever that gap might be mm. um, and then we'll help you bring up the health and well-being of those foundational tools so when I'm saying foundational tools I mean like have you got a really good scorecard that's measuring your your numbers like do you know what the key numbers you should be measuring are are they working are they telling you the right information we'll help you get that set that accountability chart lots of businesses don't have one or maybe they have a version of an org chart that mm. once upon a time was accurate and now the business shape has changed or the people have changed or maybe both or never really actually captured the accountability. So we'll help you get the accountability chart set. Yeah. We'll make sure the health of those leadership team meetings is really strong and that you walk away from that going that that was a great use of my 90 minutes for this week and it sort of helps eliminate some of the other meetings you might already be having um, and then things like everybody having a number so you know will if you're head of operations that you really know what are the handful of numbers that you are accountable for you and your department what are you driving what are you measuring and how does your number contribute to the vision that could be 20 new deals this month five new leads whatever it might be yeah right? whatever the thing might be yeah yeah and so um i guess practically speaking um what would an integrator be labeled you know is it the chief operating officer is it the general manager or is there a title at all because Often, you know, 2IC is a great one, but no one really puts 2IC on their resume or their LinkedIn profile, right? Mm. Well, can it vary? You tell, you tell me. So I've seen lots of mishmashes of different things like COO, integrator, general manager, head of people, all kinds of things. But um, I think it's worthwhile to remember that this is a function. 
and that this function is focused inward. It is focused internally. So you actually don't really need that title. They're not going to introduce themselves to an account manager or partner outside. Um, and if you do, you can choose whatever is right for your business. You know, mm. like nobody else has a sandwich artist at Subway, right? Like you know that that's a Subway yeah. thing. Yeah. So you can have whatever title you, you need. And I think that's an ego thing, right? Yeah, absolutely. But if you were going to advertise for one, like, and you were an EOS run business, I would be encouraging you to use that language of, and we're looking for an integrator. We're looking for someone who's going to yeah. integrate the key functions of our business and bring them together. It's still a new term for our absolutely. market. But if you were to um, go after what you want, you'll probably find them. It's so interesting you say that because I think if an integrator is out there looking for roles, probably much like what you were prior to knowing what an integrator yeah, was. didn't know. <laughs> you didn't know what an integrator was. And so I feel like that would be quite hard to market for, mm. um, to market for an integrator because really the way I look at it, it, it can be quite a selfless role in the sense that um, – it's a selfish role, not a selfish role. It's like a role where you're really impacting the business mm. and and sometimes not getting a lot of thanks for it, mm. right? Yeah, that's you've got it. <laughs> sometimes it, it, it's pretty thankless job, yeah. lots of invisible work um, and you kind of have to be the pessimist. You kind of have to be the say no a lot. Um, mm. You have to be willing to be the tiebreaker, lean into providing feedback that isn't always great, but also a willingness to celebrate and applaud and call out and share kudos when you do see great things. You know, I'm a huge believer that like what gets celebrated gets repeated. You know, if you, it's, this is a crass like analogy, but like when you're training the dog, if the dog sits, you give it a treat. Absolutely. Right? You want the dog to keep sitting, keep giving it treats. Like <laughs> it's never going to get sick of being told thank you and your yeah. employees or your team are the same. Like thank you goes a long way. Appreciation and gratitude is so undervalued mm. by many. Um, you know, again, you know, I've heard plenty of people say, oh, it's just their role. Yeah. Like, oh, well, I'm meant to say thank you for doing their job. Like, yes. <laughs> of course. Yeah, Exactly. Um, I'm a big believer that gratitude plays a big part in making sure the culture stays alive mm. because people need to know what what is working and what's not. And if they're just hearing, you know, constant direction and constant drive, you know, I view it as like a, a sporting team. Like if you're not getting any thanks or any appreciation, mm. you'll just stop. Yeah. There's just no point continuing. So outside of what I do with business, I run uh, or host the Date Forever podcast with my husband. So I'm going to bring in a relationship analogy here. But John and Julie Gottman, um, who have done a ton of research on um, romantic relationships, this idea um, about your goodwill sort of exchange and that for every one um, sort of withdrawal or negative interaction, you need 11 positive ones. Wow. Yeah, right? 11 to 1. Some people say it's seven to one, but, you know, I think you can overdo it. And we're not looking for the zero, right? It's not that we want peace, harmony, happiness all the time. You actually need that one negative interaction to create growth, to create opportunities. To, If there's no fraction, uh, friction, then you can't get anywhere. You can't create a fire. Um, but I think that if we could apply that in our workplaces, like for every one mm. reprimand, negative piece of feedback, redirection, you need a seven or 11 pats on the back yeah. hey good job thanks so much for that really appreciated that that thing that you did had this impact and i think everyone obviously takes on appreciation very differently right so it's being very clear on how people like to accept appreciation mm -hmm. or acknowledgement because it can be different for everybody yeah totally so for some people that 20 dollar gift voucher will go like a long way other people will be like yeah what i really would have appreciated is a public kudos in our slack channel an email saying and, thank you to the team or yeah. a public display of appreciation. Yeah. 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 No, and, I, I totally get it. and other people would coil at the thought of Correct. that. Correct. <laughs> Correct. Which yeah. is, which is, I would say the visionary's role to understand. Well, yeah. And that's um, something that an integrator, a really good integrator can do is set up those rhythms of having quarterly conversations with your team so that you can understand what they're looking for and what their unique abilities are, but mm. also how do they best respond to reward and recognition? Like what's going to work for them? Um, Definitely.
Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And look, I think um, a big part of uh, appreciation, obviously, one, understanding, um, I guess, how they like to receive appreciation. Um, but sometimes you give too much it mm. and it loses its value. I don't know if I necessarily agree with that. When it's done in the same light with the right intent, mm. you know, I view it as a relationship as you rightfully. So I like the analogy, the relationship analogy. Mm. So definitely follow Jam- Sammy's uh, podcast. Um, but, you know, you can never say I love you too many times. Or I think it's said in the right intent, said in the right manner. Mm. You can never say it too much. And in the way that the person wants to receive it too. Like Absolutely. whether or not that's like words of affirmation or gifts or like we already touched on yeah. some of them, like acts of service. There's so many different ways to demonstrate appreciation, love, gratitude. So I want to touch on very quickly just because of your experience in that relationship aspect, love languages. Yeah. Apply that to business because I, I think it is super valuable. Like I think it's undervalued in the sense that people are like, oh, love language, sure, you know, words of affirmation, gifts and whatever else. I think. Maybe just not physical touch. Not maybe physical we'll touch. Maybe we'll leave that one out. HR says no. <laughs> HR definitely <laughs> says no. But do you have a model? Have you, have you reviewed a model? Is there something that you have thought about from your experience as an integrator as a good integrator yeah. that can take that idea or that analogy and apply that to your team to get better results. Do you know what, Will? Just ask them. Mm. Like it's as simple as that. Like, hey, if you were to be rewarded for really good work, what would you like to receive? <laughs> like, And your team will tell you. Yeah. And if they don't know, encourage them to go and consider, you know, in the past, what have you really appreciated? Yeah. Like, and it's not going to be the same for your whole team. Like, and sometimes that's the trouble with like, in, um, in, you know, blanket wash incentive programs and things like that. They can actually have the opposite um, okay. effect. Yeah. It's funny because um, the question itself can feel really odd asking. Mm. You know, I've asked the question to my team and it's like, how do you like to, you know, receive mm. gifts or appreciation? And it's like, really? Like, are we asking this question? But what comes out of that is a completely different discussion that you don't really expect so Mm. it's always worth asking yeah totally awesome sammy thank you for coming on the show thanks for having me awesome having you to talk about i guess the difference between a visionary and an integrator um very clear to me and i think it's super valuable for any um, business owner even from a small aspect to start planning about how they can start to implement certain roles so if you agree i'd say reading traction would be the first to call and then reaching out to you once they're of a size that you think is relevant right yeah absolutely and as i said like reach out to any of those eos implementers if you have an inkling that you want to have a chat about the tools because they really can change a business very very quickly yeah changing the trajectory is super important mm-hmm. and especially the earlier you do it the little one percentages that you move in the right direction is going to make a big difference yeah so sammy thank you again for coming on the show thank you Socius, thank you for joining us today. Please hit the subscribe button if you've enjoyed this episode. And if you'd like to be part of the Socius community, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn to stay in touch. Cheers.